somewhere else in his bedroom and it's an absolutely stunning room I'm, as usual, man boggled by the intensity of the bed just absolutely fabulous so how did it all start Sam? Um, when I was a young lad we, my mum and dad moved to this property and it was just a traditional garden shed we wanted something to do as a, as a family, you know, a bit of a hobby. And back in the days where all pet shops kind of had birds and animals for sale, I saw some little zebra finches and fell in love with them and thought, right, I'd like some of them. But the same place was selling canaries, budgies and a few bigger parakeets, such as cockatiels, etc. And my dad said that he'd had budgies and canaries in the past, so we, we bought a few birds, basically, shoved them in this standard garden shed. And then... Went from there basically, started to put an aviary together, got the birds breeding, added to the collection, joined a local club, which at the time was foreign and, and budgies. And they said, look, instead of just having an aviary full of things, it might be worth considering the specialising in one thing or cutting down. So I've always liked the budgies because of all the different colours and varieties that they come in. So that's what we, we decided to do. We got rid of all the other birds, moved them on concentrated on budgies and just gone from there really and then ended up with this. What's the, what's the breeding methods or what you say it's cage breeding? So we, we cage breed everything, we, we don't colony breed, everything is cage bred for colour or for quality, for bloodline and at the moment we've got 48 breeding cages which we've got in this bird room and this particular season I've dedicated eight of the cages to colour budgie guards, the miniatures and then the other 40 have been for exhibition whether that's good birds or certain varieties that have exhibition type. Um, breeding season is September to May. So September May. So I pair up first weekend in September usually. Some years it does vary slightly. But so it goes over the winter period. Yeah, so we, we get them breeding and then by them starting then they'll breed through the winter. Whereas we used to do it a different way back, back in the days um, some years ago we would pair up in the middle of November, that was the in thing to do. So you then started in winter to get your chicks with the new rings on. I'm not bothered about the rings now, I'll, I'll pair up in September when the birds are at the fittest. They'll have the current year on, not the latest rings. So something that we do, we will then ring the chicks on the left leg with the, the current year on. And as soon as those new rings come in, every chick gets rung on the right leg with the new rings. So the flight that we've got at the bottom, which is all for babies, some of them will have a left leg 23 ring and all the younger ones will have a right leg 24. And that's a way of keeping on on track of how old they are roughly. Not not exactly, obviously, because then you need the number and, and the, the actual records to show that. But at a quick glance, I could catch a bird up and say, do you know what, that was a, a late bred 23, so it's got a left leg on. Whereas if I catch a bird in the flight and it's got a right leg 23 on, I know that was bred at the proper time of 2023. So that, that, that's how we personally do it. September to May it works for us. And we breed a lot of birds, so some, something's going right somewhere. What's your breeding method? I remember years ago on Ireland, I was like, uh, is it a bit of wood and it's a concave, they don't have nesting material, do they budge as well? So we, 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 we had wooden nest boxes when we started. Uh, yeah, see now. yeah since, since, since we've come in here, we did actually have wooden nest boxes the first breeding season being in here. I wasn't in business at the time, so my dad made some wooden box and a box style nest boxes. And then I started my business, and then I found a supplier in Germany who, who makes these along with other things. Mm. And I thought, well, do you know what? Germany. Yeah, they, these, are all, they, these are all German plastics, and that they're great you know they don't, they don't mean you're going to breed any better birds but it makes it easier for you they're easy to clean they're all uniform so everything's the same you can put any nest box on any cage and these have got a uh, concave inside that's built into the inner inner tray oh, it's and it just, just make just makes life easier then really good for that oh wow oh it's like a little shell so there, there, there is a there is a concave built into that that shows how long but, ago it was when I used to keep them. Wood, 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 wood. Yeah, wood is still used. A lot of people still use wood. But a lot of other materials are on the market now. Plastic, transfer, etc. So it just makes it easier to clean and easier for, for using. 
Yeah. Yeah, there's, 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 there's things like that that for for again for easiness of cleaning. There's no there's no uh, gaps in any of these. It's all glued together. So no, if we did get red mite, you would see it and you'd be able to treat it. Whereas with wooden stuff, the the actual grain of the wood, or yeah. sometimes you've just pinned it together or screwed it together. It it's giving more places for red mite to be. So. Yeah, it's hard. These are a lot easier to manage and to use in that respect. I didn't actually know. It might look like in canaries. I've never thought about that. But there could be a problem. Yeah, pl plastic is really coming on the scene now for a lot of types of birds. There's plastic, you know, ne nest pans. There's, there's plastic little finch nest boxes. There's lots of different things now on the market compared to what it used to be. I'm not saying plastic is the answer for everything, but it's, uh, it's easy to use, let's put it like that. What do you actually feed? What, what's the... They're really cool for the chicks, but... So... It's been a long time since I've... So some people just give their birds, you know, a standard budgie mix, which is usually right. mi mixed millets and canaries, whereas we've got different things that we feed to all the breeding cages. Every, every breeding cage has got a tray that contains different dishes. One dish is my own budgie mix. I've got three different mixes through Countrywide Seed. Get your own mix. Yeah, they're, they're unique to me. Obviously, anyone can buy them, anyone can use them. Uh, but Countrywide distribute them out to any of their resellers. And they get a bigger dish of my budgie mix. They get a small dish of my tonic mix. We use a dish for like a parakeet mix with sunflower in. But the I have changed that over the last few years. I've been trying to find one that I'm happy with and I still haven't found one I'm 100% happy with for wastage, basically. Uh, but we're currently now using the countrywide Australian grass parakeets. Mm. That, that's a good mix. There is a small dish of plain canary. Really? Um, well, plain canary is used in the budgie world and it's used in a lot of mixes, but never normally on its own. But we've done that since I was a junior. And touch wood, it, it works for us. The hens seem to go mad for it when they're laying eggs. So there's got to be something in there that they're wanting. We do offer the birds grit on a daily basis. Right. And the grit is mixed with three different grits. So there's oyster shell in there, there's oyster shell with coral, and there's also a, a pigeon product called redstone. It's a bit chunkier. Again, the birds seem to go mad for that. We've then got our own unique soft food mix, which everyone's got their own particular mix and how they do things. But we've come up with this recipe and we've stuck to it. Certain things get tweaked over the years for whatever reason, uh, but the soft food mix is very important. Is they... your own unique mix? Well, in the respect of mm. unique to us in that way, but yeah. it's it's lots of different products mixed together to create it. Um, but again, we, we give that to every breeding cage every single day, and we rear lots of birds. So again, I, I believe yeah. that, yeah, it's it's doing something right. So we well, I've actually just took them off last week because we're coming to the end now, but. Every breeding cage usually gets three finger draws. One is seaweed, dried seaweed. One is Thrive On, which is, Thrive On is a man-made conditioning product. And then there's also one that's a mixture of minerals. And the idea with it being in a finger draw is it's only small amount, but you've also got, it, it's an addition to the diet basis. So they, they've got choice to have it, but they don't have to live off it. And I only fill them up once a week. So if they eat it by the following day, you won't get any more till next week. You've got to wait. I still want them to eat seed. They are a seed eater, but these other bits are there as an addition. Every cage gets a piece of cuttlefish, not for the calcium reasons, more than anything, it's to basically give them something to do. So by isolating the birds and putting them in cages, we're doing it wrong really compared to colony breeding because you are forcing them to breed in that respect. So my attitude is I want to give them as much as possible mm. And I want to offer them things to keep them busy. So like with the nibble blocks, there's not a lot of iodine in these kind of things. But So you can't use it as your iodine source. But again, it's something for the hens to go mad at instead of hopefully going mad at the chicks or going mad at the cockbird. So we, we give them that. And then with the water, they just get fresh water out of the tap every single day. If it's good enough for us, it's good enough for the birds. We do put treatments into the water. So when we come to treat the birds, that will go through the water, but other than that, we do not put anything in the water. Everything is put into the soft food, because if you can make a soft food mix that they eat, you can sneak all your good stuff into there, and they'll eat it. Whereas with the water, 
if you're doing your waters properly, you could be chucking a lot of the product away and then you start again, yeah. fill it up. And so we, we just personally use fresh water every day out of the tap. Mm -hmm. Probably sounds a daft question, but any millet? Millet. Millet from years ago. I don't know. So we used to give them like with a, I think they're called shark clips. We used to, when we had the old shed, every cage would get probably a third of a millet spray every day right. for something for them to do. Um, again, seed obviously, because they love attacking a millet spray compared to a dish of seed. But because of the cost of millet sprays, the number of birds we've got, yeah, yeah. and because they would rip it to shreds, so it's only going to last a few minutes. Yeah. We stop giving them that, but what we do do instead, when the birds have, have got uh, chicks in the nest, when the first chick hatches, we put a, probably a, a fifth of a millet spray into the nest box. That's obviously not for the chick to eat because it's too small, mm. but it's for the, the mother more than anything to have something to say they keep going out all the time. She can have a bit of food to keep her in the box because you don't want them to leave the nest too long or stop feeding the chicks. And then hopefully the idea is that when the chicks are grown up, they've seen the mother eating it every day, they might then copy. So they've started to eat before they even leave the nest. That's, that's the idea, hopefully. And it, again, it seems to work for us. That's the only place we give millet sprays other than the actual nursery cages. The, the rest of the birds might get a millet spray as a treat, but it's not used as part of the diet nowadays. How do you choose to pair them up? Or do you... Oof. Is it just something you do? Without thinking, maybe. some of it's that that you know you've got an idea in your head, but sometimes it could be for colour. So you would need a specific pair to breed the colours that you want or the mutation varieties that you want. So you have to think about that. But from the show point of view, from an exhibition point of view, quality is looked at. You're looking for birds that complement each other or can really push a feature on. Um, so it's, it's quite selective breeding, obviously, you're looking at the different aspects of do you want more of this, do you want more of that? And sometimes with some of the projects or the rarer colours, it's just let's get more of them to build the numbers up or let's pair them to a decent bird to then breed splits to move on again for the following year. So it's quite a, a lot to think about because they're not just all the same colour, they're not all the same looking bird. They do vary from, we've got colour budgerars, the miniatures, we've got exhibition birds but then within the exhibition birds some of them are quite small because they haven't had the quality put into them and then we've got all the way up to some in my opinion some really good exhibition birds so we've kind of got a bit of a bit of everything in that respect 14 days i believe is it is it from eggs to it's 14 days for hatching. Hatching. Yeah. so it's eight, 18 days for hatching been a so what 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 we try to do is we I, i'd make the pairs I like to put the nest box on about a week later so that the hen has been with the cockbird because if you put the nest box on straight away, sometimes if she's got into breeding mode, she'll make a nest and stay in there. And to put it bluntly, the cockbird's not had, had chance to do the deed with her. He can't sort her out because she's in the nest box all the time. So I think leaving them out, because everything happens so fast with, with, with birds, a week to them is probably six months to us kind of thing that mm. that week being together locked away in that little cage yeah. you know that they're, they're getting on they're, they're getting to know each other they are they will get on or they won't and then it's the nest spot hopefully then after a couple of weeks you see an activity she's making a nest you should be seeing eggs by then 18 days later they hatch and off you go but budgies lay every other day so you've, you've, yeah, you've got the downside that with our birds, obviously our crosses are different, but with our own birds that they lay a lot of eggs, the cockbirds are very fertile, so that's why we breed a lot of birds. But if you've got seven eggs, if you're going to have seven fertiles, they will not rear seven themselves. So that's where fostering or moving chicks about will come into play because the biggest one is going to be a hell of a lot older than the, the day old chick that's just hatched. Yeah. So that's something that you have to think about and I do foster, I openly admit it, you know, there's, uh, there's a lot of people that say, oh, you shouldn't foster, you shouldn't do it. My attitude is for how much it costs to look after the birds, the time spent being with them, you want results at the end of the day, being selfish, you want results, so you want chicks, you want them on the perch, so if I can maximise my chances, I will do it. I don't foster purposely, but I will where I need to, whether it's to do with numbers of fertile eggs, whether it's to do with numbers of chicks, 
whether it's to do with a pair that have struggled a bit, so they, they've not been good. A lot of the time when I see infertility and stuff, it's an outcross, you think, bloody hell, that bird's not, it's not bred, that's a shame, but I can use that bird now to rear some of mine. So when we're in full flow, as you'll see now, we, we're starting to slow down. We, we, we like to be fully finished by the end of May, hopefully. So we're starting to slow down. But when we're in full flow, 48 cages with fertile eggs everywhere, it, 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 yeah. it's a good problem to have, but it's a problem that you've got to, got to juggle it accordingly. After May, what, is it just rest period until you, until you go again? And then... Yeah, so June, July and August are the quiet months for us where we won't be breeding. Ideally, there might be the odd pair that might leak into June, the odd occasion that's leaked into July because of timing, but I want to be done by end of May, hopefully, every year, that's the plan. But June, July and August then are very busy because of shows. The, the show season starts at the end of June, so you've got show season. It's preparing those birds as well, so if you want to show the birds that you've been breeding with, they need a break before you start to show them. But then, because of the way I, I, I do it, it's then, right, it's show season still going and I want to breed again because there's a lot of shows that are into September like the World Show, mm -hmm. there's the National at Stafford into October, there's other shows up and down the country still into October. So September and October we do show but a selected team or not as many as normal because I'm paired up with them. So it's busy all year round really. Mm -hmm. There's a quieter period for the birds to some degree but it's, it's a 12 month thing, there is no switch off, there is no quiet time in that respect. It's quieter when we breed because hopefully most birds are back into the flight and we just put seed and water in and, and make sure everyone's okay. But then with show season, you, you're selecting birds to show, washing them, preparing them. It's, it's non stop. They are a very communal bird, aren't they? Like yeah, well, they, they love being together. This is part of why we've done the layout like we have here that the breeding cages are facing the flight. Hopefully, they then feel like they're still part of the colony. And as you can probably hear with the noise, yeah, yeah. they love noise. Whereas some people in the budget game, maybe because of space, unfortunately, but they have smaller sheds, they have smaller setups. If you only have a X, you know, X amount of pairs, six pairs or something, and no backup. The six pairs might not breed very well because they're not hearing other birds. I'm not saying do what we're doing with lots of birds and too many birds, but a bit of noise, a bit of atmosphere. Isn't that a good part of it? Yeah, so it's like a natural environment. Yeah, these birds are all happy, as you can hear, they're all active, but they're all... And I think, obviously, there's a lot of facility and things like that that you breed into the birds. That, that's down to certain bloodlines and, and whatever. But the actual atmosphere, I do feel, plays a big part because... Some people, if they haven't got enough birds, they might need to put a radio on, make some noise, make a bit of mm. sound in there. But that's fine. But we've not used the radio for, well, I can't remember when. We, we, we don't, we don't need to. I don't think we did. Like, yeah, like. Pretty loud, I think. Yeah. But it's really bad, isn't it? It's nice. We're, 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 we're happy with it. it. It took us two years to build because of time and finances. Mm. But we're happy. There's some things I wish I'd have changed. Hindsight's a wonderful thing. But it's great, we've got big flights, we've got lots of cages, we've got a lovely kitchen area, we've got space to put babies in, there's a dedicated space to put the seed because when people are building babies, like I find at work when they ring me up and they say, oh, I want, I want 50 cages, I want three massive flights. Okay, where are you putting your seed? Where do you put the babies? Are you, where are you going to put your stuff when you're not using it, such as nest boxes and stuff? So like, oh, I didn't think about that. That's the, maybe think about where you're going to store stuff or... Yes, it's lovely to have a lot of cages, it's lovely to have flights, but you do need the other things as well. Yeah, and maybe we do fit to put... Yeah. Yeah, you see tech up room, everything... Yeah, well, we've, we've got a... It's made out of melamide, and then we've got a worktop that flips open. We can store all the seed in there. We've got somewhere for the grit and iodine blocks. We, we've got cupboards underneath where we put the show cages in the kitchen area. We've got all the drinkers and dishes where we're not using them. But you still haven't got enough space, even though this is a big bird room. We could still use a storeroom to store all the extra stuff that you. Oh, even, oh, even, more you need. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> For a beginner, can you think of any. If you're starting out, any tips? Or, if you're just starting out, I know it's a if, if somebody was starting with budgies in today's world, I'd say just enjoy it, keep it manageable, keep, keep your six pairs to start with. Six pairs. 
Yeah. <laughs> Obviously, like I said, a second ago, have some then maybe as spares or go around to people and say, look, is there any birds you can give me old birds or whatever that don't breed or just to have as noise. But if you have six pairs, that's theoretically anyone can look after six pairs. It shouldn't take you too long. You know, five minutes a cage, it's half an hour a day. You know, have, you know, have, a, have a manageable amount. You still need to do the water every day. You still need to do your nest box every day. You need feeding every day. You've got to clean them out. And, and it's having the, the, the birds that you want as well. That, that's another thing. So keep, keep it manageable as in volume. But if you want to have just colour budget eyes, have colour budget eyes. If you're into crests, have crests. If you like fallows, if you like the stuff, whatever it is, have them. You will need normals as well if you want to improve them and you want to go down the show route. But have the variety that you want because you're the one feeding them, you're the one looking after them, you're the one paying the bills at the end of the day. And when you do get up to a stud of this size, the volume is cost, you know, seed and supplements and different things, bedding. It does cost a lot of money, so you should have what you want to be looking at, what you want to be breeding, and it's your hobby. So if you want budgies and canaries, have budgies and canaries. If you want just budgies, if you want budgies and finches, if you want indoor flights, outdoor flights, it's your bird room, but if you can start manageable, there's nothing wrong with them increasing, upgrading, building another shed. I do know some people that have got two, three, four, five bird rooms because they've built another one and they've said, right, I'll have that one for putting the babies in, I'll, I'll have that one for breeding my colour budget eyes and I'll have the other one for the, the exhibition and there's nothing wrong with that because again setting a shed up in the first place it's not cheap, you need the shed itself if you haven't got one, you need to line it you need, you need breeding caves even if you buy second hand ones, it's still a cost all the time so just getting going can, can cost money so if you start small from, from the bird point of view I'd always suggest if you are serious about it and you'd like to show I'd suggest trying to find your local club, trying to find some people that you can get on with, even if they haven't got the best birds in the club, at least if you can make a friendship with somebody, it's a contact to go to, it's somebody at the end of the phone, it's somebody that you can nip round and say, I've had this problem, have you ever had that? And they can physically show you all. So I think being part of a local club is very important. Being part of a, a society as well, so like I'm part of the Budgerigar Society, which is the main society within the UK, and, and they then help run all of the shows with patronage, with the, the silly awards that I want to win, and there's a lot of us that are chasing these things because that's what we want to win and do. So by being part of that, you're part of that community that you are involved in the show side. So may, maybe, you know, be a member of the Budgerigar Society, find a local club or two, if there is, if you're lucky enough, if there's a couple close by, and then try and find some friendships, try and find people you get on with and just take your time. Start off small, build the numbers up over time if you want to. There's a lot of people that are quite successful with small studs. I don't know anybody off the top of my head that's got six cages and that are super successful because I don't think six is enough to build bloodlines in, in, in the long run. But, you know, say 15 cages. There's a, lot, there's a lot of studs with 15, 20 cages at most that do very, very well because those 15 to 20 cages, they can pair the best cock up with his brothers as well alongside him. They might still have the parents, so they pair the parents back up. Or by giving yourself a bit of numbers, you can have choice. I'm not saying go and have 100 cages straight away, but start small, build up, and hopefully keep it manageable, keep it fun. There's nothing worse than, oh, I've got to clean the birds out, oh, it's gonna take me four hours, all this, all that. You know, tr try and keep the fun side of the hobby where you can. Um, but yeah, the, the advice would definitely be join a society, join a club or two if you've got one near you. Try and find some some good people where you can, and, and go to breeders, go and visit breeders. There's a lot of online stuff now, and obviously the power of YouTube, the power of Instagram, the power of Facebook. It's amazing. Mm -hmm. Coming to see a setup, being amongst the birds, being with the breeder, looking, learning. Why do you feed that? Then what? Why do that? Why have you got that up there? There's nothing better than being. Yeah. In the social side of the hobby, enjoying it, going visiting, like with the clubs, you know, a lot of clubs do open meetings and just being part, you know, part of that with sitting amongst your friends and having a chinwag and a laugh and it is a hobby which at the end of the day and you've got to make it your hobby and whatever you want to do, if you want to show or not, that's fine, if you want to just breed, if you just want to breed rare variety or you want to breed the small ones, the big ones, it's 
it's your hobby. Yeah, it's nice, nice. yeah. Is um, green food, is that important with budgies, or do you have to be careful? Uh, there, there's certain vegetables and fruits that could come straight through them. Where, yeah. and, it, and, it, and it does depend how much they've taken as well. So as an example, you can see on, you know, you, you've had a look in the flights and stuff. I could throw a full carrot in a flight, not worry about it. Because hopefully, if everybody has a nibble, the thing's disappeared. But if you gave a full character a breeding pair, yeah. they would demolish it and have a real good go at it. But then you would see the green projectile coming out the other end, and it would cover your cage. So limit. This is why we only give a small amount of soft food per cage because some people are like, "Oh, if they're eating it, well, why don't you give them more?" Yeah. Well, we give it them to be an addition to the diet. They are feed eaters. So obviously in the flight, sometimes we'll cut up limes or lemons, oranges. Really? Right. Oranges as well. Yeah, well, like for all the vitamin C content at the end of the day, and obviously with a with a obviously when you cut an orange, a lemon, a lime, there's that nice soft juicy bit, plus there's the, the, the outside. They'll eat the whole thing, mainly the inside, but they're playing with it as well as eating it. You're keeping the birds fit, you're keeping the birds active, it's something for them to do again. Um, they're empty now, but in the flights you can see the coconut shells. When we put them on, the, the coconut meat was still there. They demolish that. Again, it's something for them to do. It's something to go up as well. Because a lot of budgies nowadays, especially the exhibitions, being a bit bigger, a bit feathery, if they're happy eating off the floor because they are floor eaters, they'll stay on the floor. They feel safe and they feel happier. They know they're being fed on the floor. Why would they go up to do anything? So that's where we try and encourage birds to come up. We, we put millet sprays once a week up on the rope. We'll put yeah. cuttlefish sometimes with a hole drill to it with cable ties. And there's a few balls hanging up in the flights with, with the little bells in it and stuff. Yeah. But just something to play with, keep them active. Mm. Um, but yeah, fruit, fruit and veg is good. Okay, yeah, but keep small amounts. And obviously you'll have to live and learn how much your birds can tolerate without getting your place covered yeah. so but like if, if we're having a sunday lunch you, you we would eat the head of oh, i wouldn't i don't like broccoli but you'd eat the head of a broccoli the stalk itself you can give to the bird most people would chuck that away so there's a use for everything you could blend it and put it through your your soft food you could just chuck it up or dice it up put it in your avery give them things to play with give them things to to eat and obviously again there's goodness in all these fruits and vegetables but certain things like maybe like lettuce, they're not going to be bothered about that because it's mostly a water content, you know, vegetable. It, it's they're, they're not going to get much out of that. They'll play with it, but it's going to cause more mess than it is actually goodness. Yeah. So it's finding things. That, that's why we like carrots, we like broccoli, we like the, the leaves of a cauliflower. Cauliflower itself, if, you, if you've got some spare oranges, lemons, limes, they'll eat all that. You could give them an apple, diced up an apple. Um, you know, people have thrown boiled eggs in flights before, all sorts, anything like this that it's giving them something to eat, something to keep them entertained. And obviously the goodness from the products as well, the item, you know, the, the fruit, the vegetable, or even an egg or whatever. But learn your amount, learn what you can get away with with the volume of birds. I remember I used to feed egg, but I wasn't sure. I seem to like it, but I don't know if I should have. We used to, many years ago, we used to boil eggs and then we'd actually throw the shell away and then someone said, well, why aren't you using the shell? And we said, well, really? actually, yeah, why aren't we? So we used to actually grate that, just a boiled egg, grate it, so the shell and the egg is all... Well. Yeah. Um, then we actually, because of time, instead of boiling them and then keeping loads of, of boiled eggs, we started scrambling egg and dicing it up. And we've tried all sorts in the past, but... Again, this is where everybody will feed them differently. Everyone's got their own feeding regime. Everyone's got a different idea. It's what works for you. If, if you're happy just giving your birds a simple budgie mix and water and you think they're happy enough, do it. But I think with the budgies, even the little budgies, I think the budgies now, because of what we're trying to do to them, we want them to breed and we want four or five chicks. Once they're finished breeding, we want to show it every week and it wants to invest in show every week. You're putting the bird under a lot of stress, you're expecting it to do a lot, you're expecting it to perform. I think we should be treating them like athletes, so they need a good diet. And hopefully, if you're giving them a good diet, you sit in a box, you, you, you're giving everything that you can. I'm not saying come to a business like I've got and buy every single product, you don't need to. But a good seed diet, a bit of grit, a bit of extras, a bit of soft food, 
cut or fish and iodine blocks for something to do more than anything. All these things, you are ticking boxes. It's there for them if they want it. You're giving yourself a chance. If you literally give them seed and they don't breed very well, could there be something more you're doing? Yes, there is. There is something more. So try and think about, again, look and learn. Go and visit people. See what they're feeding, why they're feeding it. And listen to what they say. You know, if they're said, oh, they hardly ever touch that, well, probably don't think about that product. But if someone says, oh, they eat a lot of that or they do well with that, okay, I might try that. And if anyone does ever try a product, whether it's a new seed mix, whether it's something you put in a finger drawer, a grip mix, whatever, see it through for a season. So see the whole breeding season through with it, at least that one season, and then go, okay, was that better than last season? If so, was it those products that helped, or was it a bit of luck, or was it both? Mm. And then that way you've got some answers. If you buy five on as an example, and put it in a finger drawer for two months, the start of your season goes well and then you stop using it. Right, I'll try seaweed now. Okay, I'll use seaweed. Oh, I've run out of that. I'll use minerals. What product helped? Why, when, who, what, you know, whatever. Which one was doing the job? Or was it a combination of all of them? But then you stopped and started. So yeah. things, the bird gets used to eating it and it's healthy and then you took it away. Like I hear people say that they only give tonic seed once a week. I personally can't get my head around that because... We've had a couple of birds in the past, only a couple, but a couple of birds that almost live off it. They will actually eat a lot of tonic seed. And if they're eating a lot of tonic seed, even though it's not ideal, you want them to eat the other stuff as well. But if they're living off it, they're living off it. Why would you take that away? Yeah, in point. that breeding cage, that, that bird is trying to perform, you're wanting the results, and then you're saying, no, no, they're only having that. With a seed mix, give it all the time. Every every day, our birds get exactly what you see in the cages, and it works for us. It's great as well on a little tray. It's got like a little tray and all the little... One thing I didn't know though, Sam, was um, it's just made from stuff from years ago. I didn't realise you had grit. I know it sounds silly, but... I yeah, didn't realize if, was... if you speak to budgie people in, in general in the hobby, I would roughly say 50% of people use grit and, yeah, grit's the answer. Do the 50 plant. Now I've never used it or yeah, I use it, but I don't see the point. It's a bit of a touchy subject in that respect that people either like it or they don't. We've always fed grit. Our birds do well on grit. We get good results. And when we show the birds, the birds in the like stock cages, when they come back from a show, they've got access to seed, grit and water. A lot of them go straight for the grit. Really? So the fact, the fact that they've been out for a day, they, they're going for the grit. So they, there's got to be something in it that yeah, yeah. they're lacking that day or they're thinking, oh, that'll help me. So if if they didn't want it, why would they go for it? Exactly. So. <laughs> then obviously at this age, we've rung these ones. So these have got rings on. We can only ring them at various how quick they grow, but seven to ten days old. And then if you've missed them, then it's too late. That was the thing I was on about with the millet sprays. We put millet sprays in for the hen, not for the chicks. But then eventually they will copy the mother and start eating before they even leave. It's the place when it's fresh off the mother, when it's milk and eat there, while she's an apple or something. Yeah. Hopefully the rest will happen to the bathroom. So they soon double up and I, and I can already tell what colour they're going to be. Really? So like even that one, I can't see any feathers yet. I know it's a pied. So it's got an orange beak yeah. and I can see light markings. Wow. Whereas that one, dark beak, dark markings, that's a normal. So after that nest, I've got two pieds and three normals. Oh, see. Before they even feathers have appeared. That's remarkable. Look at that. Uh, they're feathered up. Here, it? Their eggs. Okay, so yeah, that's a rainbow, that one. That's a 
Put some food for that one. And again, I can see what colours they're going to be. That's going to be a recessive pied, like that one I was showing you earlier, because of all the dark and light patches. Plus, when it was then younger, I can see it's got an orange beak. Yeah. So that's got an orange beak, and it's light. Whereas that one look was dark oh, yeah. and a dark beak. Yeah. So. Three pies are the normal there. Wow. Before I see any feathers, so. That's nice and obviously that one is old enough to ring that one probably. Could probably get a ring on that one. So three three toes forward and then flip the last one through. That's kind of, that's got a ring on it there. Five out of seven so far, first half. Yeah, so, with these, these are all the colour budgerigars. The, these are designed to be very, very small. We're trying to make them as agile looking as, as straight back as possible. Nice, fit, happy, healthy birds, basically. And one of the crucial bits is the, the six little spots. They need to be as small as possible without going too small. Because like there's one I can just see here, his spots are really thin in that fleet and he, he's lost a few spots then because of that, because they're so small. But then vice versa, on the flip side of this, you don't want them to be big, because then it draws the attention away from the actual shape of the bird and you're looking at big spots instead. But the, these are supposed to be lovely streamlined, very small, tight feathered small birds, which in my opinion, most of these are because we're trying to breed a, a good quality example.